Hello. I'm standing up. For those of you uh, who don't know me, I'm Alice Bach. I'm the director of the Hallinan Project for Peace and Social Justice and the Hallinan Professor of Catholic Studies at Case Western Reserve University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of our 2008-2009 lectures. If you are interested in receiving emails from the Hallinan Project about our Peace and Justice lectures, please sign the list in the lobby next to the cookies. Make it easy to find. Tonight, we are very honored to have Ali Abu Nima with us. Mr. Abu Nima is a writer and a commentator on Middle East and Arab American affairs, and he lives in Chicago. His articles have appeared everywhere from the New York Times to the Lebanon Daily Star and Haaretz. He's a frequent guest on national and international radio and television shows, public television, and corporate media both. <clears throat> I must confess that Mr. Abunima has been one of my personal heroes since the day I stumbled upon the Electronic Intifada, the website that he co-founded and edits. That was about five or six years ago. EI, Electronic Intifada, provides a needed supplement to mainstream commercial media representations of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. For the past two years, Electronic Intifada has been my homepage, knocking both the New York Times and the Huff out of first place. Those of you who may not have a homepage, the Huff is the Huffington Post. Um, to introduce Mr. Abu Nima's work to you, I've asked Martha Katz, president of the Interfaith Council for Peace in the Middle East, to say a few words. A counselor from Youngstown, Martha Katz and her partner, Ray Knackley, are well known for their activist work on peace issues, as well as for the film they made in the West Bank, local media reports on the Middle East conflict. Their analysis of the focus and bias of local TV and print vehicles in the United States in covering the crisis in Palestine has become a staple of Sabeel conferences throughout the United States. We will um, have a question and answer period um, after the lecture, and I would ask you to keep your questions short and civil. After the lecture, we hope you will all join us for a reception so that you may greet Mr. Abu Nima personally. And now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Martha Katz. Thank you very much. And before I forget, I'd like to also mention that Ali's book will be for sale out in the lobby, and he will also inscribe it for you if you wish. Ali Abu Nima was born in Washington, D.C., but grew up largely in Europe, where his father served as an ambassador in several different countries and for the UN. His parents were born in pre-1948 Palestine, his mother in what is now Israel, and his father in what is now the West Bank. Uh, they had to leave after 1948. Mr. Abunima holds a BA from Princeton University and an MA from the University of Chicago. In addition to being a co-founder and editor of the Electronic Intifada, more recently he's been a co-founder of Electronic Iraq and Electronic Lebanon. And Alice told you that he's had articles in many different publications um, and has also appeared frequently on radio and television, including the News Hour on PBS and Democracy Now! He's contributed to a number of books, and his book, One Country, A Bold Proposal to End the Israeli-Palestinian Impasse, was published in 2006. I found it to be a, a wonderful book and a very uh, even-handed book and a very compassionate book. 
In the introduction to and the acknowledgments of his book, he cites the inspiration of his parents who taught him to see the Palestine-Israel impasse through the prism of the universal struggle for human rights rather than as a tribal or religious conflict. Please join me in welcoming Ali Abunima. Good evening, and uh, thank you for the very gracious introduction and the very warm welcome in Cleveland. And thank you all for uh, coming this evening. Um, it's a little bit daunting to be standing in front of such a big room. Uh, put yourself in my place. Um, and especially after a summer where, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of speaking and then during the summer I do none. So this is my first time back to school and, uh, and so I have those first day of school nerves. So uh, hopefully uh, everything will go well. I'll, I'll talk for um, less than an hour, probably about uh, 45 minutes or so, and, and then We'll have plenty of time for questions and answers, um, and I think, and then that will be it. And I look forward to your um, your questions. And and as much as you'll try to make them short and simple, I know that that's not always possible with such a topic. Um, one of the the things that uh, struck me since I since I published the book and have gone and spoken to people about it, including uh, Palestinians, um, audiences all over this country, uh, American Jews and others, um, is that I, although the idea of a one-state solution, a single state for Israel-Palestine, is less um, strange today than even a year or two years ago. It's a more common, even the New York Times had an article a couple of weeks ago saying how this idea is spreading. Um, I'm struck by how deeply ingrained is the idea that uh, Palestinians and Israelis could not possibly live together in a single state. And of course, there are a lot of compelling reasons to, to think that. Um, this is a conflict that has gone on for almost a century. It is one uh, that is, in my view and the view of many others, rooted in uh, settler colonialism, that you have uh, a settler colonial community that came from Europe with the goal of displacing an indigenous uh, population that was already there for its own reasons. They had their own ideology for, for doing that. But that was an experience that was common in other parts of the world and also led to violent and protracted uh, conflict. So there are many reasons to think that. But what, what strikes me is the notion that uh, you have a, a country, a territory with two groups in it, uh, regardless of how uh, they came to be there. And they are in a conflict. And that the solution, therefore, is to divide the territory uh, the way uh, King Solomon uh, talked about dividing uh, the, the baby that two women were fighting over. And that will solve the problem. And that was the logic that underlay the 1947 UN General Assembly vote on partition. And the logic is the same today. Basically, it may be messy, it may be cruel, it may require uh, population movements, but at least it would provide finality, definitively separating two hostile ethnic groups whose claims to sovereignty and self-determination in the same territory are irreconcilable. And you hear time and again exactly the same logic today for a two-state solution. Now, uh, th as the uh, political scientist and authority on ethnic groups in conflict, David Horowitz, observed, the only thing partition is unlikely to produce is ethnically homogeneous or harmonious states. 
Rather, partition brings about a reordering of heterogeneity. It simply mixes things up. And the specific cases of Ireland, Palestine, India, and the former Yugoslavia, these are all territories where uh, partitions have taken place. The attempts to carry out partition, or the actual partitions, did not end violent civil conflicts as their proponents hoped. Instead, as Joe Cleary has written, partition has generally served as a watershed, as a decisive realignment not only of the communal forces, but of the very terms of the conflict. What was a hot civil war, he observes, afterwards resumed in slower gear, as it were, as a more cautious and protracted Cold War between and within states. Partition has also invariably been accompanied by various forms of ethnic cleansing, forced population transfer, and coerced assimilation, all in the name of producing the supposedly normative conditions for liberal democratic statehood. And the violence that uh, is portrayed by proponents uh, of partition as being a uh, necessary but uh, transient uh, evil has become chronic. As Cleary has said, it is not incidental to but constitutive of the new state arrangements uh, thus produced. Now, this, so I, given all that, I said, well, I would like to go and, and look in the uh, literature and see what the brainiest people have come up with on where partition could work, where it would not uh, result in such terrible things. And uh, what emerges is that despite decades of toil, uh, political scientists and conflict resolution practitioners have yet to come up with any robust theory or evidence showing when and where partition could be applied without these kinds of results. And so it did generally fall out of favor after the uh, de uh, era of decolonization. But it has, there has been a revival of interest in partition uh, in the early 1990s with the wars in Yugoslavia, and again particularly after 2003 uh, when the United States invaded Iraq. Uh, of course, one of the loudest proponents of partition of Iraq has been Senator Joseph Biden, uh, although that is not something we hear about so much today. Um, typically, the literature, the, the current literature on partition takes the form of advice to uh, a great power, in this usually in recent times the United States, although who knows how long uh, that will be for at the rate things are going. Um, and just to give you an example, one article I looked at by two political scientists in California starts like this, in the midst of civil wars in such diverse countries as Serbia, Somalia, Iraq, and Indonesia, analysts have asked whether peace would be more secure and democracy would be more likely to flourish if we partitioned those countries rather than attempted to keep them whole. That was the first sentence, and I immediately asked myself, who is we, and what right do we have to be deciding uh, whether or not to partition countries? But most of this literature, what you find is that it accepts the inevitability of ethnic cleansing and argues that this should simply be done in a humane way, that the transportation of populations should be organized uh, and, and that kind of thing. So it's not surprising that, uh, that academics, are we still, can you still hear me? All right. I can shout really loud. Is this a live one? This is a live one. I'll continue with this one until we fix the other. So what you, you find is, is it's not very surprising that uh, scholars and activists who are concerned about human rights and ethical uh, uh, values uh, have increasingly looked 
towards solutions for conflicts that do not involve partition and seek to avoid the kinds of uh, uh, evils that it has invariably involved. Uh, and there's a quite vigorous debate among political scientists and others about, well, what kind of unitary state can bring uh, can ethnic groups in conflict together, whether uh, a, a confederal state, a consociational state, all these different uh, uh, ideas circulating. So there's a fairly extensive literature on how to achieve such unitary solutions in Northern Ireland, in Cyprus, in the former Yugoslavia, in Sri Lanka, and many, many other places, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and so on. But there is a curious absence of Palestine-Israel. It, it is largely missing from this literature, and that's very curious to me. Instead, what you find, of course, there is a separate emerging debate about a one-state solution, but it tends to be happening in parallel to these discussions uh, about uh, uh, non-partition unitary solutions elsewhere. Uh, instead, what you find are constant assertions that partition remains not only the best and most practical solution in Palestine-Israel, but the only one possible. And this is despite the fact that many of the same scholars uh, acknowledge that Palestine-Israel has much in common with other well-studied cases where partition has been uh, ruled out. Um, now, I, I'm not going to try to explain this inconsistency. I don't know the answer. It's something that I'm, I'm looking into. But um, I, I, I did try to think about, well, what would be some of the reasons that this partitionist thinking when it comes to Palestine is so deeply ingrained, why it seems so natural to us that partition is this? This is back, good, because I'm going to, to walk over to the uh, uh, audiovisual display here. But um, so if you, this is sort of a, it's a bit big, but uh, we'll just uh, do it to a smaller scale here. So this is, as you can see, a very detailed map of the area in question. But this is a map we see constantly, and it's, it's, so this is Palestine, Israel, and this is the West Bank, and this is the Gaza Strip, and we see this map constantly. And so what I think happens is that for many people, Supporting a two-state solution or believing that it is the most obvious, the closest, the most within reach outcome um, appears to be simply recognizing or ratifying a partition that has already happened. And that, in fact, there already exist uh, distinct political geographical entities. One of these is the State of Israel, which is the unshaded area, and the other is a Palestinian state in waiting whose statehood merely awaits declaration. Uh, this impression is constantly re reinforced, as I said, by maps in newspapers like this one uh, showing the pre-1967 uh, borders. Uh, the discourse about a Palestinian government, we talk about a Palestinian government or Palestinian governments because there's one in the West Bank and one in the Gaza Strip, and claims by those involved in the peace process that the contours of a political solution are already virtually agreed uh, and along the lines of the so-called Clinton parameters. You don't need to know in great detail what, what that is. I'm happy to explain later, or the Geneva Initiative, we're constantly told everybody knows already what the outcome will look like. What's lacking is the political will at the top to make it happen. And that's a story we're told constantly. And the implication is 
that other than a few minor details, tweaking borders here and there, resettling uh, refugees, uh, legitimizing settlements and uh, re redefining Jerusalem, the dirty work of partition has already been done. Well, if it's so easy, as we're constantly told, and, and peace is just around the corner, just needs another summit or uh, another president or uh, uh, just someone to knock heads together, why doesn't it happen? Why hasn't it happened for decades? I would argue that, uh, that uh, partition along these pre-1967 borders was actually only a brief traumatic interlude in what was and remains a binational reality. Any attempt to implement a two-state solution would therefore once again require massive violence with consequences no less disastrous and unpredictable than earlier partitions. The uh, historian Ilan Pape has stressed the pattern of continuity in Palestine's modern history, beginning with the late Ottoman period, as a geopolitical entity with its own cultural cohesiveness and distinctiveness. He contrasts this with what he calls the dominant mainstream Zionist perception of Palestine as formed of two units, one Jewish and one not Jewish. And this map already reinforces that discourse of, of two pre-existing units, one Jewish and one not Jewish, simply waiting to be uh, declared and recognized. But if we take Ilan Pape's account of, of a binational distinctive cohesiveness prior to 1948, then we can see that this continuity was violently disrupted by the partition and ethnic cleansing that took place in 1947 and 1948. Although its effects, particularly the dispossession of Palestinians, still endure, partition reordered but did not destroy the binational reality. And by binational reality, I'll say more about that later, but the reality of two communities living within one space uh, with a lot of interconnections and interdependence that, is, that can only be broken with violence. Uh, comparing the 1921 partition of Ireland, and, and for those who don't know much about the history of Ireland, th there's a lot of uh, scholarship showing that these are very similar cases uh, in many ways. Of course, there are big differences as well. Uh, but comparing that partition in 1921 with the partition of Palestine in 1947, Joe Cleary notes that neither of these partitions uh, heralded, as was hoped and expected, a durable status quo. Uh, in Northern Ireland, the partition set up a a Protestant-ruled mini-state, which collapsed in 1972 amidst the civil rights movement and later the armed struggle. In Palestine, the partition effectively ended when Israel conquered the West Bank and Gaza Strip in 1967. In both cases, the collapse of the partitionist order heralded a resumption or intensification of intercommunal conflict. Uh, describing the period after these collapses when partition fell in on itself in a sense, in Northern Ireland you had British direct rule and in, in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, Israeli military occupation. Uh, Cleary refers to um, now, I don't usually quote Gramsci when I speak. This is a first. Uh, not that I have anything against Gramsci. I don't. It's just a first. Uh, Cleary calls on Gramsci's concept of the interregnum, uh, an in-between period, uh, in which the uh, ruling class has lost its consensus. It is no longer leading, but only dominant, exercising co coercive force alone. 
Now that to me is a very compelling description of the situation that existed in Northern Ireland for decades and exists today in Palestine, Israel, particularly in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The Israelis do not rely on a legitimate political order to rule the Palestinians. They re rely on coercive force alone. Uh, and and uh, uh, Gramsci went on that it is a period in which the old is dying and the new cannot be born. Uh, arguably, the Northern Ireland peace process, in contrast to the Palestine, Palestine Israel peace process, ended the interregnum, giving birth to a new and potentially lasting political order. We won't know probably for a few years, but for the moment, that, that's a reasonable prediction. Um, but if during this interregnum politics remains blocked, we retain this map, life on the ground does not. And on the 40th anniversary of the 1967 occupation, so just last year, Meron Benvenisti, who is a very thoughtful Israeli scholar and also the former deputy mayor of, uh, of Jerusalem, wrote, the decades since the war have proved that 1967 was not a disjunction, but quite the opposite, a union, and that the preceding period was merely a reprieve. The Six-Day War, the 1967 war, was the final battle in 1948's War of Independence, and the partition dictated by the armistice agreements in 1948, which lasted for almost 19 years, was eradicated by the Israeli occupation. Benvenisti rejects as too limited and misleading the occupier-slash-occupied paradigm for describing the post-1967 reality. He calls it an anachronism that, behi that hides behind the portrayal of a temporary condition. And he says that we should inst instead call the situation that exists a de facto binational state because it describes the mutual independence the mutual dependence of both societies, as well as the physical, economic, symbolic, and cultural ties that cannot be severed except at an intolerable cost. Um, uh, another Israeli scho scholar, uh, Oren Yiftachel, uh, has uh, added that, the in, that today the interdependence of processes across Israel-Palestine persists despite the historically significant attempts by uh, Rabin, Barak, and Sharon governments, successive Israeli governments, to recarve an exclusive Israeli political territory leading to a repartition of Palestine. And I think his use of the word repartition is significant because he's talking about it as uh, a single uh, unit. Now, the efforts to repartition Palestine, to create a two-state solution that satisfies uh, either Palestinians or Israelis or both, ha have been hampered precisely because the original partition line in 1967, fa uh, in 1948, sorry, these lines, failed to do the job of separating and dividing. Uh, returning to the comparison with Northern Ireland, uh, Joe Cleary has observed that um, Northern Ireland underwent a process of fragmentation in the, since the 1970s that was so extensive that it could be argued that since the 1970s, the partition of Ireland no longer stopped at the interstate border. The militarization of local territorial boundaries and the increased segregation of its two communities have effectively produced a whole series of internal partitions as well. And I think that that is a very good way of looking at the situation that exists throughout Israel-Palestine today on both sides of these lines. Uh, and particularly 
in, and in ever more extreme forms, particularly with Israel's construction of uh, the wall in the West Bank and walls around Palestinian cities and the pr proliferation of checkpoints and so on. Uh, now, the, in Northern Ireland, the, the troubles, as they're called, the civil conflict, did not manifest at all alo along the interstate border between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. There were very few incidents along that border. It was on all those internal partition lines, the hundreds uh, or thousands of internal partition lines that, that were the sites of conflict and struggle. And so it is in Palestine. The front lines are everywhere on both sides of the lines you see here. And cutting across these front lines are the ties uh, of interdependence uh, between uh, the, the various groups. Uh, partition does not only manifest in physical and political separation, but also in the cultural narratives of its victims and beneficiaries, because there are always victims and there are always beneficiaries. Uh, again, returning to, to uh, Cleary, in his comparative study, Literature, Partition, and the Nation State, he proposes that in partitioned societies, cultural narratives represent one of the ways through which the trauma of partition is subsequently memorialized and understood and that these narratives can either help to ratify the state divisions produced by partition or to contest the partitionist mentalities generated by such divisions. In other words, are the stories that people tell, the cultural narratives about partition, are they ones that legitimize it or delegitimize it? Do they tend towards getting people to accept it or to resist it? Now, if this is the case, then we can begin to see uh, that there is one way that Palestine is an exception and uh, is distinguished from other post-colonial partitions, uh, including Ireland, Cyprus, India, Sri Lanka, the former Yugoslavia, uh, and, and others. In each of those cases, an actual or proposed partition was accepted and defended as legitimate by at least one of the antagonistic communities, even if it was viewed as deeply illegitimate uh, by the other. The community favoring partition was almost always able to identify and limit its demands to a particular portion of the territory. So in Northern Ireland, uh, unionists, Protestant unionists, claim only the six counties in the north. They have never had any ambition to extend beyond that area. Uh, in, uh, uh, in India, the Muslim League claimed Pakistan, even it's, though its boundaries were not necessarily known at the, at the time, uh, it was never more than a part of the whole territory of India. The same with Cyprus. Turkish Cypriots claim what they call Northern Cyprus, which again is part of the island, and so on. Uh, the, uh, Tamil Elam in Sri Lanka, the pattern continues. Kosovo uh, in Serbia is again only a fraction of the territory. So uh, in Palestine, Israel, uh, it, it appears that neither Israeli Jews nor Palestinians uh, have ever internalized partition. And to the extent that one segment of each community has done so, it has been tactical and very highly contested by other parts of the, the community. Israeli Jews and Palestinians have consistently failed to embrace mental, political, or emotional maps of their own group's territory that covers anything less than the entire country. Frequent uh, and frequently, Israelis object to Palestinians using maps which show, whether in textbooks or in symbols or graphics, which show this as the shape of Palestine. They say that means that you don't recognize Israel. If that is Palestine, then Israel cannot exist. 
Uh, and, and so you must not show that map because to show it means that you, you want to destroy Israel. It reveals your desire to destroy Israel. Um, but paradoxically, all of the Israeli official maps show exactly the same territory without any internal borders. Neither Israelis or Palestinians show internal borders. And you can see this on official government maps uh, in Israeli school textbooks, the first time that they attempted to introduce maps in the school textbooks showing internal borders that suggested a limit for the State of Israel, there was a political uproar. Uh, but one of the things that struck me when I was in Ireland was the television weather maps. Weather maps, after all, are a form of cultural narrative, whether or not, uh, uh, you know, in this country, uh, the maps tend to show the United States and they don't show Canada. In Canada, I was very surprised that uh, the United States was off the bottom of the screen. And I thought if they could just pull that up a bit because something's gone wrong and, and the map is too low. Uh, so these are uh, also cultural narratives. And what struck me is that um, both the, so the, the Israeli and Palestinian maps tend to show the entire country without internal borders. In Ireland, when you look at the uh, weather maps uh, on the state broadcaster RTE, they depict the entire island of Ireland like this. This is my map of Ireland. Doesn't that look like Ireland? <laughs> right. So they depict the entire uh, island of Ireland with Dublin here and Belfast here with no internal frontiers as if there had never been a partition. And then when you look at the weather maps in Northern Ireland, they show Northern Ireland without anything else, as if Northern Ireland is an island in the sea all by itself, not connected to any other landmass and n neatly summarizing the stereotypical view that one group recognizes the partition, is so recognizes the partition that they, they believe nothing else exists, and the other group behaves as if it never happened. So the point of that quite lengthy uh, diversion is to say that if one condition for a quote unquote successful partition is that, um, that it should have legitimacy with at least one and eventually both of the groups who are to be partitioned, then Palestine is probably the worst candidate of all because uh, partition has no legitimacy with either group. And my argument is that uh, the two-state solution is not the easy default option that many people still believe. It is in fact the radical option that re would require us to embrace partition anew with all its horrors. It would require at least the involuntary movement of hundreds of thousands of Israeli settlers, many of whom are armed. It would require millions of Palestinian refugees to remain behind fortified frontiers they do not recognize and cannot cross. And who can guarantee that it would not spark the ethnic cleansing of, say, Palestinian citizens of Israel? It is much more likely that it is for these reasons, rather than a lack of political will or insufficiently intense peace negotiations, that a two-state solution has never been implemented. Given the stubborn attachment of both Israeli Jews and Palestinians to the entirety of the contested territory as manifested in their national narratives, we can further conclude that if there are objective criteria, which I doubt, for uh, prescribing partition, then uh, as, I, as I said, Palestine is probably the worst candidate of the lot. The default option then is to begin by recognizing the binational reality infinitely fragmented and unequal though it is. Then we can begin to consider how to change the political regime and the state system to fit the people rather than trying to exchange the people to fit the regime, which is what 
the two-state solution has been about. I'm going to stop there because I'm almost reached 45 minutes and you're going to ask me, okay, well, how can we do that, hopefully? Or you're going to contest what I've just said and all of that is fine and uh, I'm happy to get into that discussion. Uh, at the microphone, yeah, so if you kindly come forward to the microphone. Uh, France and Germany have no natural uh, geographic boundary between the two. Long history of messiness, Alsace-Lorraine, Saarland and all that. Have you looked at that historical conflict, which now seems more or less settled? Uh, in, in, the, in, uh, in, in your idea, and does that give you hope or, or not? Uh, well, it, it, I haven't looked at it very specifically, but in general terms, I mean, what you're pointing to is that, um, as one, one uh, author said, that it's important not to make a fetish of borders, and that is uh, really what has happened in, uh, in, in a situation where nobody can agree on borders. And we have to ask, really, what borders are there to do? Borders are certainly there to divide people, but um, they generally tend to be more salient and relevant uh, and, and contested when the people on each, who are to be on each side of the border uh, are uh, very unequal. So um, we do not worry about reinforcing the border from Canada because Economically speaking, there's a great deal of uh, equality between uh, uh, Americans, on average, and Canadians. Uh, we worry a lot about, um, about the border in the South. We, I don't worry about it. I, I'm happy to see people coming and going across the border as much as they would like to. But uh, um, because people have always moved. They've moved for thousands of years before the United States existed across those territories. The borders preventing that kind of movement are a quite recent uh, innovation. And what they seem to be intended to do is to ensure that, that we get to keep what we perceive that we have and that other people can't get their hands on it. And what seems to have happened between France and Germany, again, is, is you look that there's a great deal of political and economic wealth and generally on aggregate equality, and so those borders have lost uh, any salience. The borders that exist here, they're, they're of course, they do have some relevance. I mean, uh, Gaza, this is a real hardened frontier. And, you know, on one, on one side of that frontier, you have a million and a half Palestinians imprisoned in a way that I think is unprecedented in history. I cannot think of a case where a million and a half people have been held under siege in such a cruel and brutal way for so long and kept in absolute misery. Most of these people are refugees from towns and cities inside Israel. And, and there's a per capita income of, you know, a couple of hundred dollars a year, 80% of people reliant on, uh, on uh, UN handouts. And on the other side of that border, you have Israel, which uh, is, has a higher GDP per capita than, um, than uh, Greece or Portugal. And uh, so it, it seems to me that that has some relevance and that uh, the issue of uh, social justice and redistributive justice is, is, is relevant where, when you look at um, how committed people are to having borders. Um, my group is Middle East Peace Forum. We're having two speakers tomorrow night, one a Palestinian American and one a peace activist who got into Gaza this summer. And if you want to see me after the meeting, I can give you the details who, who, of the meeting. Can you say their names? I have a question, though. Yeah. Uh, my question is, could you expand upon uh, the ethnic cleansing? Is it how much of, how is the taboo going as t 
time progresses. That's number one. Number two. What, what do you mean? I, uh, well, there's a, I felt there's a taboo to even mentioning that concept in the United States. Is that changing at all? Maybe you could measure that. The second would, thing would be, how would, they, what's, how would they ethnic cleanse people out of Israel proper, the Israeli Palestinians? Thirdly, how and where would they ethnically cleanse people out of the West Bank and Gaza? I mean, how would that look if, if it were to well, happen? People I, imagine that, I would guess. Well, I think that, um, that, uh, that you know, of course, there's, there's uh, among, among scholars and historians, including Israeli and Palestinian and others, there's very little taboo, even uh, among scholars like Benny Morris who support the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. They don't shy away from calling it ethnic cleansing, but they say, you know, ethnic cleansing in this case is good and necessary. And there are, I, I cited examples of scholars or, or referred to them uh, in, uh, coming from American political science who also say ethnic cleansing is inevitable, but we should make it humane. So we actually organize the transport of people so, um, but there's little debate among scholars that what happened to the Palestinians was ethnic cleansing, that you couldn't go from, uh, there's no precedent in history for a country going from having a vast majority who were uh, of, of one ethnic group and, you know, in a few months that's overturned completely. People don't just get up and leave. Terrible things had to happen to make them leave and it's understood that that was well-planned ethnic cleansing, because otherwise how could you fulfill the goal of the Zionist movement to establish a Jewish state in a country where Jews were only a third of the population? It couldn't be done otherwise. They were a third of the population and not sufficiently concentrated anywhere to, to, to claim a particular piece of territory. Um, some people say, and I would agree, that ethnic cleansing is continuing now, that it's never really stopped, that, that it happens by various other means in terms of uh, the wall in the West Bank, which is gradually pushing Palestinians off their farmland and making it inaccessible to them, and Israel is settling Jews in those areas that are cleared by the wall. It happens very quietly, very subtly, and so people don't uh, uh, notice it. Uh, it, it's not, you know, people being herded onto trucks at gunpoint, uh, and so it doesn't get the name ethnic cleansing. People have talked about administrative ethnic cleansing, where Israel uses, um, you know, blatantly biased uh, criteria to prevent Palestinians living in Jerusalem, marrying uh, uh, Israeli citizens, uh, staying in their own uh, houses in Jerusalem in order to change the demographics. These are explicit policies designed to maintain a particular demographic uh, ratio in Jerusalem. So could there be the kind of ethnic cleansing that the words conjure? And I think yes. I mean, the, the, one of the uh, scholars writing on Northern Ireland about, you know, one of the suggestions, not very popular, there, remarkably, given how popular it is in Palestine, was to repartition Northern Ireland. Okay, we didn't do it right the first time. We ended up with too many Catholics in the wrong place, so let's draw the lines again and see if we can get it right. And he says, there is no easy way to partition Northern Ireland along ethnic lines. Any plausible boundary or set of boundaries would leave Belfast, which contains around a third of Northern Ireland's nationalist population, within unionist boundaries, nationalist, Catholic, unionist, Protestant. Given that many of the newly partitioned areas would remain ethnically heter uh, heter heterogeneous, there would be question marks surrounding the durability of the new frontiers, the kind of uncertainty that leads to ethnic cleansing. And when I read that, I thought, well, you know, people are talking about the possibility of ethnic cleansing there. Of course, it can happen anywhere. Uh, if, you, if you set up the structure. So we can see, I can see Jews being unhappy, Israeli Zionist Jews being unhappy that, okay, there's this Palestinian state and, and yet we still have a million Palestinians here. Why do we still not have our pure Jewish state? And, uh, and uh, you see spontaneous or planned or organized ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in Israel. There's already a lot of incitement uh, uh, for that uh, in the Israeli media and so on. On the other hand, you could have angry settlers who, uh, you know, feel betrayed at being uh, 
uh, left behind in enclaves in the West Bank or being removed and they go after Palestinians. You could have Palestinians who say, okay, now these settlements are isolated, we're going to take them out at last. They've been dominating us for uh, so long. So it, it's, it's possible to see it happening in any number of ways. Yes, uh, I just was wondering, what's the prospect of peace and how could the American Muslims and American Jews work on playing a, a positive role in establishing peace in the Middle East? That's a very good question and a very relevant one, of course. Um, I, I think that peace begins with clarity about what the cause of non-peace is. And I think often we shy away from that kind of clarity because it's very hurtful. Uh, you know, people perceive it as being very hurtful. And particularly so in an American context where we all want to get along with each other. And so I, I, I find that sometimes discussions that happen here in this country uh, tend to um, obscure the extent to which this conflict is driven by radical inequality political, civil, religious, economic, and so on. And that you have a situation that is, um, that is a, not an exact analogy, but a lot of similarities to apartheid. You have a state that privileges one ethnic group legally, socially, economically, in so many ways, and denies uh, the most fundamental uh, political, human, social, and cultural rights of the other group, and has uh, set about um, making them politically irrelevant. So you've had for 40 years Israel ruling over uh, millions of Palestinians who have no uh, say in choosing the government that rules them. It is a Jewish sectarian government ruling over millions of people who have no say in it. And, uh, and that this system is maintained by immense coercive force, and that coercive force is subsidized and propped up by the United States. Now, that's the sort of clarity that I think is needed, because otherwise what we tend to fall into is sort of a pattern of, well, here's two groups, and they don't get along, and if only they could just understand each other and listen to each other, then everything would be fine. No. I mean, uh, we see, for example, children coming over here. There are these camps that bring Palestinian and Israeli children together, and they get on fine, like children do anywhere. And they play, and they do all the things children do. And then they go back, and they're reinserted into a structure of radical inequality. And the fact that they can get along perfectly well outside that structure does nothing to change the structure. So we have to attack the structure, and we have to, to aim for uh, replacing a, a, a political regime that privileges one group with one that treats everyone equally, and uh, provides enough protection for all groups that they feel uh, secure for some transitional period after this long traumatic conflict. And you know, there are ways to do that. We can, we can look at how they've done it in South Africa. We can look at how they're trying to do it in Northern Ireland. It's terribly, terribly difficult. But it begins with the recognition that what is fundamentally missing is equality. It's not simply a misunderstanding. I gave you a long answer because I feel that I, I, I often encounter this with people trying to do the work here and, and, and find themselves hampered by that lack of clarity. Are there polling data uh, that are recent in Israel and Palestine on the one state, two state question? And the reason I ask is that I thought I'd seen in a recent news report, uh, you know, some data indicating that 60 percent of Palestinians. That it's. Uh, that, that maybe that about 60% of Palestinians support a two-state solution. And the, the other question is, with, with one state, uh, wouldn't the oppression ethnic cleansing become worse? After all, who would be in charge? Well, I'll start with the last part of your question is, I don't know why it would become worse. Uh, I mean, unless the implication is that Palestinians are, are somehow 
you know, naturally worse than Israelis. So far, the vast majority, if not all of the ethnic cleansing has been done by Israeli Jews against Palestinians. Now, one of the fears of Israelis, and it's a legitimate fear, absolutely a legitimate fear, is, well, if we give up our monopoly on power, um, then what's to prevent the Palestinians doing to us what we've done to them? And that was the same fear that, uh, that, um, that whites in South Africa had. Is, um, uh, as F.W. de Klerk put it, I, I quote him in the book, that you know, whites are riding the tiger of black anger and how can they dismount without being devoured by it? So those fears are legitimate, uh, but they do not justify maintaining the system for even an extra day. The question is how to deal with them. What can, you, you can't put any absolute guarantee that uh, nothing bad will happen. All we can say is that the, the sooner we try to come up with a system that uh, treats everyone fairly and mediates conflicts and inequality fairly, then we lessen the chances. Um, but those fears are part of what has to be dealt with in a solution. In terms of public opinion, um, I think that one has to treat all opinion polls with some, um, uh, with a little bit of skepticism. Um, not, because, not just because of the usual things, you know, it depends how you ask the question and so on, but the context in which the question is asked. Now, if you take Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, there have been polls that uh, for a decade have asked about support for a two-state solution and a one-state solution, although they don't always specify, you know, they're not, as I said, there are caveats. But what's remarkable is how low support for a two-state solution is in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, which after all are the areas that would benefit most from a two-state solution. And uh, it's, it's rarely exceeded 65%. And it's now around 50% and sometimes below, depending on which poll you look at. And I'd argue that that's remarkably low, given that you have a multi-billion dollar, what I call peace process industry, constantly drumming into people that, uh, you know, there's no solution but the two-state solution. And, um, and there is no major political party advocating a one-state solution at this point. On the other hand, support for a one-state solution, a single state where everyone is equal, has, has ranged between 25 and 40 percent. In the West Bank and Gaza, again, remarkably high, given the absence of this option on the official uh, uh, agenda. Now, when you take Palestinians inside Israel, that's more than a, almost a million and a half Palestinians, 1.4 million, the polls show that overwhelmingly and consistently they support a state of all its citizens, what they call a state of all its citizens, equal rights for everyone and not a Jewish state that gives special and better rights to one group. So there you have a clear majority of Palestinians favoring that. And in the diaspora, I haven't seen any, any studies that I would rely on, but there we know that in, in the diaspora, by far, there is much stronger support for a one-state solution because of the right of return. A two-state solution would negate the right of return for refugees, whereas a one-state solution is consistent with it. Um, among Israeli Jews, the support is terribly low, and that's not at all surprising because uh, the proposition is that you, you know, to Israeli Jews, is you will give up your monopoly on military, economic, and political power and share it with those whom you have denied it for many, many years. And there are, there are very few groups of people in history who have done that without uh, a, a lot of struggle to get them to that point. Certainly in this country, um, uh, demands for civil rights were not met with, uh, with uh, uh, rose petals and candy and sweets as uh, we were supposed to be greeted in Iraq. They were met with dogs and hoses and bombs. And uh, governors on down uh, said, no, we'll never end segregation, we'll never end Jim Crow. This would be the end of our way of life if we did that. 
So uh, that was the same proposition. You will give up your monopoly on, mi on military, economic, political power and you'll share it with those you, you've denied it. And, and we resisted it in this country pretty vigorously. Um, so uh, it, it requires a struggle and it requires Israelis to feel that there is a price for the status quo as it required white South Africans. And, and that's why I think that the strategy that increasingly Palestinians are adopting of boycott, divestment and sanctions is a good one because it says to Israelis, you know, we're going to exact a price on you for maintaining the status quo. We're not going to starve you like uh, uh, Israel starves, you know, actually does, like uh, uh, they said, put people in Gaza on a diet. But we're going to make it so that you cannot enjoy the fruits of this uh, unperturbed, that you cannot uh, 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 enjoy it without uh, feeling some price. And that's what uh, boycott, divestment and sanctions tries to do, to raise the price of the status quo. At the same time, what I'm trying to do and others is to put forward an alternative to say there is, there is a price to the status quo, but there's also a way out. Uh, and, and I think the time will come when Israelis are ready to look for that way out, but not until they feel that the status quo has, has reached its, its dead end, that is coming. Um, I, I think your argument for a one-state solution is very convincing. I think it's logical. Uh, I, would you speculate for us about how and when you think such a thing might occur, uh, keeping in mind the anger, the pain, the hurt on both sides? Yes. Well, it's very dangerous to predict the future, so I won't try to give you a date. But I think that um, there are some conditions that I think would probably have to be in place before it could start to happen. And I think some of those conditions are already appearing. Of course, I want to preface my answer by saying that a happy ending is not inevitable, that, uh, that the uh, end of the status quo could be a bloodbath. It could be something much worse than we have now. And that's why I think we have to make every effort to avoid that. One condition, I think, is that there has to be less inequality in power between the two groups. And uh, that is something that um, is measured in different ways. In military power, Israel still holds a tremendous uh, unassailable monopoly. And Palestinians are not going to defeat Israel uh, militarily. Um, but there are other forms of power that are important to recognize and cultivate. One is simply demographic. The fact that Palestinians are now 50% of the population in the entire territory and within three years will be the, uh, the absolute majority. And that gives them both a sort of a numerical strength and a moral claim that we are now the majority population and we have a right to, 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 uh, to uh, have our appropriate share of power. Demographic power doesn't automatically translate into political power, but it's one factor. Um, another factor is moral power, that, uh, that Israel as a state that is built on ethnic and racial and religious discrimination is losing its, uh, its moral claim. And that's something, again, that uh, Palestinians can, can uh, use. Um, and it also dictates that Palestinians should be very careful and very wise in how they resist uh, an overwhelming power so that they do not lose or compromise their moral claims. Um, so those are different forms of power. I think that, uh, that, that, the, that we often forget, and I'm sometimes criticized rightly for paying insufficient attention to the regional and global context, which I think is very important, that the role Israel has played in the region has been, you know, sometimes it's caricatured and portrayed as simply being, actually there's this argument, uh, you had uh, Walton Mearsheimer here, is Israel the uh, tail that wags the American dog or is, is it the other way around? And I think it's, it's probably 
a, a bit of both. But the, the, I think the, the main story is that Israel has been able to exist in the absence of political legitimacy. Israel has not gained the consent of the people it governs. Because when, when you erase those lines on the map, you remember that Israel governs millions of Palestinians. Uh, so without political legitimacy, Israel relies on force. And the Zionist movement has always uh, relied on a great power sponsor. Uh, in the formative stage of Israel, it was Great Britain. Uh, for a brief period in the 50s, they tried to make a switch to France. And after 1967, it became the United States. The debate that is happening now in the United States, and Walton Mearsheimer are a manifestation of that, is whether the price to the United States of that sponsorship is too high. Um, and also, because Israel relies so heavily and exclusively on backing from the United States and has no allies, uh, not any that uh, uh, are worth very much to it, um, then a decline of American power in the world is likely to mean that Israel's position is also more challenged. And that decline in American power is, is inevitable and se seems to be happening in some senses even faster than many people expected. And it's, it's measured in, in, in many different ways. And of course, the recent uh, events in, between Russia and Georgia are one manifestation of, of the end of the unipolar moment for the United States. And we see the rise of indigenous resistance movements in the region like Hamas and Hezbollah that um, have managed to gain both popular support and legitimacy. And at the same time, uh, of course, they don't match Israel, but they have managed to place some limitations on Israeli power such that Israel can't um, uh, uh, can't simply dictate what happens in the region. So all these are signs to me that there is a moment at which Israeli Jews will have to decide to fight to the end and, and just, you know, double down, as they say. I don't gamble, but I hear that phrase all the time when they talk about Iraq. Uh, or to say, let's negotiate a way out of this. Uh, and, and that, again, if we can learn from parallels, is what happened in South Africa to some extent. Whites fought and fought and resisted change until they realized that, that they had to either fight to the finish, fight to the death, or embrace change where they could preserve a place. And I think what we have to do is make sure that there are alternatives, humane alternatives, already on the table so that when that moment comes, there is something to talk about. But I'm not talking, I, you know, people say 50 years or 100 years. I'm not giving you a date. I'm not giving you a deadline. But I think that this kind of change can happen faster and sooner than we expect. Well, back again to the uh, peace process. I'm sort of obsessed by it. Um, since the, sec the first Gulf War and the Oslo, there have been a lot of meetings and uh, convention, convention and, and getting together and uh, trying to bring about a peace process. And so far, it has not been successful. And it just seems to me that it, either one party or the other is trying to use it as a maneuver just to postpone what is expected. And they use it as a tool to uh, accomplish other things and putting things on, re uh, on reality. In other words, you know, by the time we decide who gets what, who gets what, you'll have the uh, West Bank pre you know, occupied by mostly uh, Jewish settlers. So the issue in here, what I'm trying to say, are these people really honest about dealing with uh, the peace process or just a maneuver among others? Well, um, there is a lot of dishonesty and deception in it, yes. 
but I don't think that's the whole story or even the most important part of it. I mean, one of it is politicians. So on the one side you have Israeli politicians, uh, on the other side you have Palestinian politicians who have lost legitimacy and support and whose only constituency is this peace process industry that has become a multi-billion dollar self-sustaining industry. Um, and it's not going to bring peace. Peace will not come from the peace process. Um, but I think that the reason we've reached this point is, is what, what I tried to say is that, that uh, yes, the Israelis do use it cynically, and this is what I talk about, you know, the deceptive element, cynically to buy time. In the meantime, they keep building new settlements and, uh, you know, expanding the colonies in the West Bank. But at the same time, they realize this is a losing strategy uh, because there are today more Palestinians in Palestine than ever before. And, um, and Israeli Jews are leaving. Um, th there is a sort of a Israeli Jewish population growth is flat, if not declining. Um, and there is net migration. You have many young Israeli Jews who prefer to go to Europe or come to the United States uh, and, you know, who get out w if they can. Um, and so I think really what I would say is that the, the, the so-called peace process cannot deal with the price of repartition, that, that there is a binational reality that nobody dares speak its name. But we're starting to see cracks in that now, where more and more you hear people who, for whom it was a great taboo six months ago talking about the end of the two-state solution. They don't yet dare utter that, okay, a one-state solution. Uh, but the, the sort of uh, the dominant discourse of a two-state solution is cracking under the pressure of the reality on the ground. And, and I think they just string it along because they can't admit that. And they're just going to kick it to who comes after them to deal with. that there's no major political groups in either Israel or Palestine that support the, the one-state solution. And I guess I'm wondering why that is. And I mean, you could, you could point maybe to the situation nowadays and say there's, a, there's been a loss of legitimacy, corruption on both sides. But even in like the past 30 years in Palestine, um, it seems like the, the consensus, at least in terms of the poll numbers, has been for, for the partition. So I guess my question is why and what, what kind of dynamic would it take to, to shift things in the direction of more political support for the solution? Well, I should be more precise. There is a movement for a one-state solution. It's small, though, but it's growing. I'm in touch with a, a group in the Gaza Strip that is, is advocating and organizes events for a single democratic state. They've invited me to speak. I can't go and speak. I wish I could. So we're going to do it by Skype. Um, uh, but, you know, there's, so there's a group in Gaza, there's many activists in the West Bank, within Israel, of course in the diaspora, there have been many, several conferences organized on this issue and there are, are more uh, in the pipeline. And it's a growing discourse, a growing discussion. And it's not just among, uh, you know, uh, activists and academics, it's also uh, at the grassroots. Uh, within Hamas, there is a debate about this. Hamas has not declared, they've hinted that they would support a two-state solution, but there's active discussion uh, within Hamas, even some proponents for a one-state solution, it being clear that this is a state in which uh, Jews and Palestinians live uh, together. Uh, and, and there Hezbollah pres provides some precedent because Hezbollah is very clearly in favor of a multi-ethnic Lebanon. They have no ambition to impose uh, uh, um, their rule on all of Lebanon. And so that provides a model for an Islamist movement that has managed to fit its ideology to uh, a, a sort of a, um, a, 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 a multi a, a, a sort of a, a multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, reality, a modern, a modern Islamist movement, because of course there is a long tradition in Islam of that kind of um, uh, coexistence. Um, 
So why have there been no groups? I think w w we should remember that there have been throughout history, both among Zionists and Jews, supporters of a binational single state, and among Palestinians. And among Palestinians, the, the uh, single democratic state was in fact the official position of the PLO till the 1970s, and it was abandoned in, the, in favor of the two-state solution because they thought that offering Israel the 77% uh, of Palestine in which it was established in 1948 in exchange for a Palestinian state in just the West Bank and Gaza Strip, which is 22%, would be a deal Israel couldn't refuse. And Israel has refused it consistently. They say, no, the West Bank is much too much for you uh, and we would like to give you much less than that. So for Palestinians, it was a, it was a calculation that, uh, well, our aspiration may be towards a single state, but the best we're going to get is a two-state solution. Turned out that there is no support in Israel for a two-state solution in reality, that Israel has invested billions and billions of dollars uh, and many lives, incidentally, in, in, in recreating the binational reality that existed prior to 1948. And, and that is now starting to catch up with people, and so we're beginning to see um, uh, an increase in support for uh, a one-state solution. But there's a lot of catching up to do in terms of, of beginning to, to think through all the issues involved, because it's not an easy solution either. It, it may be uh, the one that, that we, we are pushed towards, but it's in no way easy, and so we have a lot of catching up to do in terms of thinking through all the issues uh, of not just uh, constitutional issues and how you organize it, but transitional justice, redistributive justice, dealing with property claims, refugees, compensation, how all of this is managed is a, a huge endeavor. to um, let everyone know that we just have time for a few more questions. So people who are standing right now will be it. Um, and, and what I'll do is, is let everyone ask their question or give their comment, and then I will close. That way as many people as possible can Perfect. do that. Perfect. And I'd like to also remind everyone that there are books available to purchase and sign in the lobby after this speech. I, I was really glad to hear you uh, speak about um, divestiture. I think that um, the one-state solution is very interesting, but as you comment, quite difficult to even imagine, having been in both regions, one, I've seen the very insular nation of Israel. Um, the people are very insulated inside something that's really good for them, and I see that as being really difficult for them to give up. Also, I see the people in the West Bank, at least, I've not had the opportunity to be in Gaza, but they have very little to give up. <laughs> there's, you know, you comment about this piece of the map. Well, I've seen that piece of the map, and there's, you know, little dots that they're in um, at best. So what you're actually suggesting would be to have them enter into what um, now the people who are living, Palestinians in Israel, have, which is very little as well. They have very little say and very little um, power. Um, which would be really moving towards that South African place that you've mentioned where you have apartheid. Um, I'm wondering, going back uh, to the question of the gentleman, um, about Muslim and Arabs and Jews working together here, what we could do towards divestiture that would actually cause difficulty for Israelis or let them be removed from that insulation. And lastly, how we do that without that appearing to be a militant move, because I've seen even within our own government, when we don't have all of the congressmen agree with resolutions towards Israel, those congressmen are labeled as some sort of evil. Thank you. Uh, yeah, referring back to the Northern Ireland, I wonder if you could just kind of clarify um, the, as far as I know, I don't know a whole lot about Ireland, but um, that they are on the way to peace, and yet they still 
have a, um, a partition state. So I wondered if you could kind of clarify that or if I missed something there. So you, you gave us reasons for thinking that partition will not be a solution that will succeed. Uh, can you give us some positive reasons for thinking that a one-state solution will succeed? When the example of a one-state solution that we have in the Middle East is Lebanon, and since 1920, when it was created as a state, it's clearly not been peaceful, and the one-state solution really hasn't worked very well there. Well, those are th three very good points and questions. Are we a uh, final one? Did you? Yeah, please. Final one. <clears throat> uh, I, I would disagree with the last comment about Lebanon. Until it was made to, you know, bear the cross of Palestine, uh, it was certainly wasn't perfect, but it was the only democracy in the Middle East, especially and including Israel. Thank you very much. Uh, secondly, I think it was very important. It's been talked about. This isn't really about partition at all, not as far as the Israelis are concerned. This is about Indian reservations. This is about disenfranchisement. This is about what we and the Union of South Africa, the other USA, have done to the indigenous people there. It's not about one state or two state. It's about how can we keep people from assuming their rightful place as human beings, political power, because as you said, it's a dirty little secret, but the majority population, probably even as we speak, when you count people who hold a worthless passport or refugees in the West Bank and Gaza, it's Palestinian. So, you know, to me, uh, Israel can negotiate ad infinitum. In fact, that works to their advantage. The fact is, how do we keep people disenfranchised so that the Zionist enterprise can continue as if the whole area is populated exclusively by Jews, and there's a tiny Palestinian minority. Thank you. I'm going to take those as comments, and thank you for them, and I'm going to respond to the, the questions <laughs> as quickly as I can. Of course, you're right. Um, there's, we don't have the time to go into, uh, into the whole uh, in depth about Ireland, but yes, some of the critics say, well, it maintains the partition. You still have two jurisdictions, the United Kingdom, and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and, and that's true. But from my, I spent a year in Ireland, and um, I think that you can't compare the partition that exists there with what exists in Palestine. There is now no restrictions on movement over the border. You get on a train in Dublin, you get off in Belfast, there's no passport checks. You don't, when you're driving, you don't see any difference. I mean, you start to see so the road signs are different, but there's no uh, uh, actual check. More importantly, there's complete freedom of movement for the people. So uh, you can take citizenship in either part. You can live and work in either part. That is partly um, because of the European Union rules on free movement of people. But there are other aspects, too, in that um, you have tremendous now, uh, part of the peace agreement uh, that was necessary is sort of cross-border governmental arrangements that kind of recognize the, uh, uh, the role of the South in the North. But th th explicitly in it is the, is the recognition of the, uh, of the right of the people to change the constitution of uh, this setup, these state arrangements by democratic means. So there's no such thing as you know, the equivalent of uh, Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state would be um, uh, Northern Ireland's right to exist as a Protestant enclave or, or state. There's no such thing. The, that it's, it's clear that the state arrangements have to have the consent of the population, and they can be changed by the population through democratic means. So that's fundamental. And it's unsettled. It's unsettled in that nationalists still desire to remove the border, and unionists still 
desire to preserve it. So that's unsettled. But within Northern Ireland, what you have is a power sharing government, which is not, I'm not uncritical of, but is uh, interesting in that it is in some senses sort of the political equivalent of a coalition between Hamas and the Likud party or something like that. And, and what you see is that there is over time some moderation of, of the politics. Um, at the same time, you also see on the ground still a great deal of division and segregation and bitterness, which goes to show that these things don't change overnight and that it's not necessary for everyone to love each other before you can come to political arrangements that they can all live with. And that's also a very important uh, uh, lesson and one that I'm still delving into and hoping to bring back some useful uh, lessons for. So thank you very much. Thank you.